Hello, thank you all um, so much for being here tonight at this hybrid event in person and online. Um, my name is Kasha Paprocki, and I am Associate Professor in Environment in the Department of Geography and Environment here at the LSE. Um, it is such a tremendous honor to be introducing you this evening to Wendy Wolford, who is Robert A. and Ruth E. Polson Professor of Global Development at Cornell University, where she is also the Vice Provost of International Affairs. Um, I feel the need to confess to you at this moment that um, Wendy was my PhD supervisor and I have tried unsuccessfully to keep these introductory remarks brief. Um, Wendy has been a Fulbright Fellow, the winner of many awards including those from the Ford Mellon National Science and Social Science Research Foundations as well as the Distinguished Career Award from the Association of American Geographers Cultural and Political Ecology Specialty Group. She is a scholar of the political ecology of development, agrarian political economy, and social mobilization. And her earliest work was based in uh, Brazil with the Brazilian Landless Workers Movement, the MST, with whom she has spent years conducting research and advocating on behalf of land rights for agrarian peasants and workers. This work was the subject of her uh, second book, for her first and second book, including the second, which was This Land is Ours Now, Social Mobilization and the Meanings of Land in Brazil. She's an ethnographer of extraordinary conscientiousness, a commitment which um, consistently sharpens the rigor and political potency of her scholarship. About her first book, James Scott wrote that Precious few ethnographic subjects have ever been accorded the respect, critical eye, and deep attention that Wendy Wolford pays on every page to ordinary Brazilians. Her engagement with social movements, however, as I said, is not purely an intellectual exercise. She conducts research in collaboration with social movements that not only seeks to understand them, but also contributes to their struggles. At the invitation of the MST, she has collaborated with movement members in leading workshops, in writing, and in sharing about the movement and its work with popular audiences. As a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Peasant Studies and a co-founder of the Land Deals Politics Initiative, Wendy has expanded the range and scope of this political work and its corresponding impact on the field. Responding to a dramatic increase in large-scale land deals in the late 2000s, the Land Deals Politics Initiative created and supported a network of hundreds of scholars to investigate the phenomenon that came to be known as the global land grab. Along with these collaborators, Wendy led a whole generation of scholars to examine the dynamics and nuances of this massive wave of agrarian investment and dispossession. This work expanded not only scholarly, but also popular and policy attention to this phenomenon exemplified by Wendy's own testimony to a special session of the FAO in Rome on trends in global land grabbing. It is through a combination of these deep collaborations in Brazil and her more expansive eye to land grabbing as a global phenomenon that she first went to Mozambique in 2013, following Brazilian scientists sent there to participate in an agricultural development program that was dramatically implicated in these global land grabs. So that is what she will be speaking with us about tonight. <clears throat> we could not be joined by a better person to serve as discussant about this important work than Professor Catherine Boone, um, who is Professor of Comparative Politics here at the LSE in the Department of International Development. She is a fellow of the British Academy as well as of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and is among the world's leading experts in comparative political economic development in Africa with specific specialties in questions of land tenure property rights, and territorial politics. She's the author of three books on these topics, most recently of Property and Political Order, Land Rights, and the Structure of Politics in Africa, which won the American Political Science Association's 2016 Lubert Book Award for Best Book in Comparative Politics, among several other awards. In this book, she describes how struggles over land have become the defining characteristic of African politics, an argument that demonstrates the urgent need for scholarship on agrarian political economy in Africa, both of the careful comparative type that she offers in this book herself, as well as of the kind of nuanced historical and ethnographic type that Wendy is going to share with us this evening. So it's an honor to be joined by both of these tremendous scholars this evening. Um, Wendy will share about her own research, followed by some reflections and discussion from Catherine. And after her discussion, we will open the floor for questions 
to our speakers from both <clears throat> our in-person and online audiences. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. For Twitter users, the hashtag is LSE Elusive Plantation. The event is being recorded and will be made available as a podcast, um, subject to no te technical difficulties. But for now, I am delighted to hand over to Wendy Wolford. Please join me in welcoming her to LSE. I don't know, it's going to be very hard to match the, uh, that introduction. Thank you very much, Pasha. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. I um, am in a department of global development. It's a very interdisciplinary department, and I am fairly interdisciplinary, um, but a geographer by training and by inclination. So it's very nice to be here in the heart of geography. Um, thank you to uh, Kasha for inviting me, and thank you to Catherine for agreeing to be the discussant. This is the first time I've presented on this work. I just finished drafting a book manuscript, um, and so I'm excited uh, to get to talk to you about it today, and I look forward to all of your feedback. I will actually um, say that I, I, I can really use the feedback. All right, I'm not sure. My eyes are starting to go. Um, let me, yeah. OK. So what I want to do is start the talk today in 2009, 2010. This was a long time ago now, but this is the year, and Kasha mentioned this already, that this ambitious new project named Pro Savannah was first launched. Pro Savannah was this trilateral project, as you can see, that was organized between Brazil, Japan, and Mozambique. It was the brainchild of the leaders of the first two countries, of, of Brazil and Japan, who wanted to build on a collaboration that they had undertaken in the 1970s when their two countries collaborated with the United States in a project called Pro Cerrado. By most accounts, Pro Cerrado was a huge success transforming the center-west region of Brazil, the, what is known as the Cerrado, into one of the most productive agricultural regions in the world in just 10, 15 years. Today, the center-west is dominated by large-scale input-intensive agriculture, particularly uh, soy and cotton plantations. Property sizes here are on average four times larger than the rest of Brazil, and this is already a country that has one of the most unequal land tenure um, systems uh, in the Western Hemisphere. In the wake of the most recent food and fuel crises, sort of the mid-2000s, Brazil and Japan came together again, this time partnering with Mozambique to transform what was pitched to be or leaked to be um, roughly 14 million hectares in north central Mozambique. The idea was to transform this region into a modern large scale producer of commodity crops, particularly soybeans. For this country, for this project, each of the three countries took a different role. Brazil was going to contribute, contribute the scientific research. Um, this was going to come from their experience and their expertise that was garnered through the Posehadu project, the soybean miracle. Japan financed new rural development models and deepened the eastern port of Nakala to ship out bulk grain. Mozambique supplied the land and labor. In anticipation, the project established a private fund to raise about $2 billion in greenfield financing. I went to Mozambique for the first time in 2013 and I will say I didn't really mean to do research in an entirely new country. I was very comfortable in Brazil. It's a very large country, Brazil. Um, I didn't really mean to start a new project on this new continent, um, but I was following these Brazilian scientists over to Africa and particularly to Mozambique. My intention was to do research on this project, on Pro Savannah. But the project met with huge protests domestically, and it essentially fell apart. There was uh, really an embarrassing number of foreign students and researchers who were there in 2013 when I met, um, who were there to study Pro Savannah. But by 2016, 2017, Pro Savannah had gone into hibernation, in the words of one activist. So over the course of those four years, 2013 to 2017, and particularly during six months in 2016 when I was on a Fulbright um, in Mozambique, 
I interviewed roughly 100 government officials, Brazilian and Mozambican agronomists, and other agricultural-related researchers, extension agents, aid workers, and community activists and members, many of them more than once, and everyone had a different reason for why Pro Savannah failed. They blamed the investors, who never materialized. They also, different groups within that, blamed the farmers, who didn't adopt the new Brazilian varieties and protested the project's lack of transparency. There was blame for the foreign scientists, who brought inappropriate technology and looked down on their Mozambican counterparts. And finally, of course, the state politicians, who failed to consult the people who were living in the project area. All of these narratives, I want to argue, tell a part of the story, but I came to realize that the blame was misplaced because the question was wrong. The question wasn't really who was responsible for the failure of Pro Savannah, but why did anybody think it was a good idea in the first place? So briefly, some facts and figures for those who aren't familiar with Mozambique. This isn't a very large country, but it is fairly densely populated. There isn't a lot of idle or empty land. Of the 33 million people living in the country in 2022, roughly 70% live in the rural areas, making a living from a combination of agriculture and petty retail or service. The northeastern corridor where Pro Savannah was intended to be, outside of the capital, is the most densely, uh, is the most densely populated region of Mozambique outside of the capital. And that's because the land is pretty good there. The country as a whole is rich in natural resources, and if you look at the World Bank or USAID pages on Mozambique, they will say that this is a country that has everything to um, grow rapidly and grow well because of the access to minerals, natural gas, coal, etc. But Mozambique is actually desperately poor. It ranks 185th out of 191 countries in terms of the Human Development Index, with over 60% of the population below the level of poverty. In the rural areas, the World Bank uses this indicator called multidimensional poverty. Uh, Eric Thorbeck came up with it originally. He's from Cornell, so I have to mention that. Um, this multidimensional poverty looks not just at income or just at a single understanding or even the triple understanding of uh, uh, inequality or poverty, that is the HDI, but instead looks at a, a multiple set of vulnerability indicators and estimates that roughly 95% of the people living in the rural areas in Mozambique are under the line of multidimensional poverty. According to recent documents presented by the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development in Mozambique, almost all farmers in the country, 98.7%, are small farmers with an average farm size of, size of roughly 1.1 hectares. Beyond this 98.7%, 1.03% 1 of farmers are medium-sized, and a quarter of 1% are large farmers. Only 4.3% of farmers have access to extension services, and only 46 have access to improved seeds or to any kind of mechanized uh, tools, tractors in particular meaning that most farmers farm on their own with fairly rudimentary implements and technologies. So in this densely populated region, where the majority of the population is economically vulnerable, farming on small plots of land with hand tools, how did Prosehadu, with its endless fields of soy and cotton, come to be seen as the right model? Specifically, how did Pro Savannah, or foreign investment and research into large-scale mechanized commodity production for export, how did this, Pro Savannah, come to be seen and defended as the right use of capital, science, land, and political power? Asking this question meant that the project had to shift from a focus on Pro Savannah as the object of study to Pro Savannah as a window through which I could understand the historical present. This was a little bit upsetting for me because I'm not a historian, um, but I was able to access and make good use of the archival materials in both Mozambique and Portugal, as well as conducting the participatory and qualitative research that I mentioned already. What I found was that Pro Savannah made sense in Mozambique because the territory had been envisioned as a site of extractive plantation production since the Portuguese first established firm colonial rule in the early 1900s. 
For well over 100 years, the country's power structure, market orientation, transportation infrastructure, scientific knowledge, racial hierarchies, land tenure regime, as well as labor dynamics and laws have been organized to support extraction. And here I focus on plantations, but there's considerable research on the extraction of other natural resources, such as coal, minerals, and natural gas. Today, in the context of global neoliberalism and a one-party state, a reliance on external donors and widespread poverty, there's consensus among state officials and development practitioners that Mozambique needs development fast, and introducing large-scale agriculture for export continues to exert this incredibly strong pull as an effective fix. High rates of rural poverty, small farm sizes, these are all read as an opportunity, the possibility for plantations to be transformative, rather than an indictment of their historical and ongoing failure. And for as long as people in power have plantations in their sites, longer term and people-focused development goals, like schools, internal markets, healthcare, skill building, and the cultivation of vibrant small farm communities, these take a back seat. So you can see this playing out, I would argue, in the most recent revision of Mozambique's land law, which has essentially taken what was on paper one of the most progressive land laws in the, in the world, um, where land was defined as a national good for the purpose of local communities, and has made it easier for outside interests and investors to acquire large areas for export-oriented production. So that's a, a sort of big argument, and I don't really have time to do it all justice. Um, I was going to introduce the chapters of my book a little, but I'm going to skip this in the interest of time so that I can focus on three things. First, I want to provide a little bit more theoretical and empirical detail um, on the way I think about the plantation and what I call the plantation ideal. Um, and the way that that shaped agricultural research, research specifically in Mozambique. Second, then I want to spend probably the bulk of my time detailing the way in which the focus on plantations has shaped life on the land for local residents. I want to do that through an analysis of manioc production to show how plantations, envisioned as ambitious, charismatic projects to grow and export tropical commodity crops, are made possible by local labor and indeed by this very humble or modest manioc. Third and finally then, I'll finish by presenting the alternative development visions that have been suggested by a handful of dedicated scholars and activists of and in rural Mozambique. Okay, so to begin the section then on the theory and the empirics of plantation science or plantations. The term plantations, particularly for people from the United States, invokes a very specific landscape, namely the tobacco and cotton plantations of the US South from the 1600s to the 1900s. We think of Scarlett O'Hara, I don't know if you do here, <laughs> um, of chattel slavery, tropical commodity production, and elegant big houses. But plantations look different, of course, across time and space. They're usually defined and expressed as large-scale monocrop production systems or economies historically dependent on enslaved or forced labor and designed for extraction, though often also self-reproducing as labor sustain themselves in a, can be a very closed system in terms of uh, producing subsistence on small plots of land. But this neat and tidy description of a plantation as a physical space obscures the way in which the model of production has become internalized as an aspiration, an ideal landscape of efficient, rational agriculture incorporated into the global market. This ideal, then, has the ability to shape the way that knowledge is produced about a landscape, the way that infrastructure is organized, and also the way that political elites are sustained. From the early years of Portuguese rule, government officials, international experts, and local bureaucrats all argued that East Africa's rightful place was as a producer of tropical plantation products. The archives from the early period of colonial rule in Mozambique are filled with invocations of Portugal's glory 
and celebrations of the nation's prowess in having discovered East Africa, and they recount the seemingly endless possibilities for making the land productive, making it flower. The plantation was seen as the key to unlocking this profit and prosperity. Mozambique's ecology was compared favorably to surrounding regions like Natal and Rhodesia. Visitors to the territory called upon administrators to establish research centers to determine the best cultivars and production practices and to share these findings with European colonists who would oversee local residents who would do the work. Local labor was necessary, it was argued, because Europeans were not suited for that kind of labor in tropical conditions. The influential American agronomist, Otis W. Barrett, toured the territory in 1908. He waxed enthusiastically in his official reports, claiming that Mozambique held, quote, millions of acres of the finest alluvial soil fairly aching to show the farmer what big crops may be grown. With careful management, large profits should be readily made in this promising region, and Mozambique will come gloriously into her own. This analysis and the commission with which um, Barrett traveled won significant praise. The reports that they published were repeatedly, were, were published uh, multiple times, first in English and then after some outcry in Portuguese. And Barrett was installed as the first director of the new Department of Agricultural Services in Mozambique. Over time, the scientific infrastructure that developed had key characteristics that continue today. First, a reliance on external funding for agricultural research, where Mozambican priorities are taken into account but interpreted through the interest and capacity of each international aid agency. And here I'm sort of trying to provide some indication of this chapter that I have, chapter two, which goes over the um, dynamics of agricultural research in the colonial period and how those are similar to many of the dynamics in agricultural research today. So a focus on um, external funding for research, a focus on commodity production for the external market, which means that research really emphasizes the discovery or development of new varieties. So really focuses on breeding rather than a, a, an investigation of native varieties or land management. The third characteristic is the separation of research and farmers or extension agents. Extension agents are supposed to be the link between researchers and farmers, and that link is, um, uh, you could argue, not really present um, in Mozambique. Research is seen as technical, not applied, and not applied to the poorest farmers who would be likely not engaging directly in the market or not in these uh, uh, commodity crops. And then fourth and finally, the perspective of local residents where they are seen as laborers rather than farmers, whether they provide direct service on plantations or indirect service through contract production. So I don't have time to go into each of those arguments in detail. I just want to elaborate a little bit on how they played out in Pro Savannah. Mozambican government officials said in interviews, particularly as the protests against Pro Savannah developed, they insisted in interviews that Pro Savannah was always intended to help small farmers. But project documents and leaders focused from the beginning on research efforts that would help to build agro-industrial export capacity. They argued that the proposed plantations would have multiplier effects creating development poles that would build on local technology to support the still incipient Mozambican private sector and a handful of larger farmers, incorporating the bulk of the poorer farmers or smaller farmers into the project as contract growers. As the lead researcher for the Brazilians said, from the first, we had the idea of developing large-scale agriculture. The project was designed as part of the development of the Nicola Corridor, and so our expectation was that we would work with advanced agriculture. We would work with machinery, with experiments on large plots of land, with the development of commodities like soy and corn. This focus on modernized farmers to the exclusion of actually existing residents was highly racialized. 
The top ranking Brazilian technician that I just quoted um, insisted that Pro Savannah didn't fail. This was as the project went on and it became clear that it wasn't going to achieve the sort of results that it had achieved in Brazil. But he insisted that it didn't fail because of the Brazilians or because of the inappropriate technology. Rather, the problem was that the Mozambicans themselves didn't have the skills to keep up or the drive to work out difficult problems. Makuas, as he called the Mozambicans, referring to the largest ethnic group in the north, are very lazy. They don't want to work hard. They have basic technological skills, but they need better management, and they need to stop burning and moving around or engaging in Sweden agriculture. The idea that Brazilian scientists could bring technologies developed elsewhere to Mozambique was justified in the project's vision, um, both by the notion that uh, Brazil and Mozambique's environment might be somewhat similar, what they called parallels, because they were attached at the hip, according to the World Bank in the former landmass Gondwana, but also because the new cultivars were described as politically and scale neutral, politically neutral and scale neutral technologies that could be adapted to the Brazilian context, the Mozambican context, via universally recognized scientific techniques. So Embrapa, the darling of the Brazilian miracle in soy production, was going to be the transfer of these technologies to the Mozambican context. Felix Paulo, the director of Pro Savannah, said in a meeting in Brasilia on May 31, 2016, Pro Savannah starts with the assumption that improved varieties will increase agricultural income, transforming subsistence agriculture into modern intensive agriculture, mechanized by the promotion of initiatives oriented towards the market, increasing employment and processing, and conservation of agro-industrial productions. Brazilian researchers assumed that these new varieties would be Brazilian, given their experience with and research on relevant crops, particularly cotton, corn, and soy. This focus on breeding new varieties characterizes agricultural research in Mozambique more generally, and it tends to come um, at the expense of or without consideration of adoption, whether or not these new varieties are actually going to be taken up. Many of the research projects at IOMI, which is the head um, national research agency, end with a demonstration of crop characteristics on farmer fields or, excuse me, in the research stations, but very few of the researchers are able to really factor adoption into their work, whether prior to breeding or afterwards. As one scientist with a large international research organization put it, scientists say, I'm not a politician. They, we, are worried about technical problems. We are worried about the number of varieties we can liberate. This is a serious problem. As a result of this focus on breeding, there is little scientific research on land management. One scientist from this same institute, the National Institute of Agriculture, or Agronomy in Mozambique, dismissed land management alternatives like conservation agriculture as, quote, a thing of the university. Theoretical, end quote. Um, it was theoretical uh, rather than applied practical research. A grant maker for the FAO in Maputo agreed saying that conservation agriculture was just for poor people. Mozambique needed research that would help it to develop, which meant orienting more, more towards market crops and commercial farmers, that very small number of commercial farmers. This emphasis is shaped in part by the preferences of external donors. These external donors are often headquartered in other countries and interested in projects that can be scaled up, whether from Mozambique or to Mozambique. Scale is often the holy grail of, of development work. And that same grant maker that I quoted before said, the donors have areas of preference. For example, I'm not going to talk about gender or human rights with the Japanese embassy. They don't have any interest in this. But if I discuss the issue of fishing, I can do that with the Italians. Wildlife and forests, I can do that with the Germans. Gender with the Norwegians. Rural poverty, I can do that with the British. But if I want irrigation, I can talk to the Japanese. And statistics, I can talk to the Swedes. The Mozambican state 
writes impressively inclusive national policies, such as the land policy of 1995 and the land law of 1997. But the state lacks the capacity or the will to oversee the most important aspects of community rights and consultation. Instead, the primary contact between the state and small farmers is in the form of paternalistic and opportunistic handouts. So for the, that's a brief overview of research in the context of the focus on plantations in Mozambique. And what I want to do for the rest of my talk today is to focus on chapter four of the book, which is on local farmers. Chapter five is as well, so this is one piece of it. Um, what it helps me to do is to spend more time away from a specific plantation or a specific plantation project, and instead to demonstrate the broader set of ways in which the focus on plantations over the past 100 years has shaped life and labor on the land. When the Portuguese tightened their rule in Mozambique in the early 1900s, they did not have the capital, people, or scientific capacity to settle or produce throughout the territory. They relied on foreigners, as I said earlier, for assistance, but where the Portuguese believed that they did excel was in, and this is beyond their expertise in navigation, was in ruling over local residents and bending them to labor on the land. This belief draws on a racialized set of assumptions that people often refer to as lusotropicalismo or lusotropicalism, that somewhat of a controversial framing for it, um, and I'm happy to go into it in the Q&A at the end if anybody is interested. The Portuguese established a system of labor laws known as the indigenato, indigenato that rested on the concept of tutelage, under which local residents had moral and legal obligations to work a certain number of days per year. This tribute system was known as the chibalo. The indigenato codified this legal difference between Europeans, who were put in the census as civilized, and indigenous, or the natives, requiring all adult indigenous males to voluntarily engage, engage in work because, as the labor law of 1899 said, the black and only the black can fertilize Africa. Local residents provided voluntary labor, voluntary in quotes, um, on plantations, and they were increasingly, uh, over the course of the 1900s, incorporated into the economy as contract farmers, providing crops as an annual tithe. This was arguably the harshest labor regime of any colonial power in the 20th century. Eric Lina refers to it as slavery by any other name in the title of his excellent book although it wasn't chattel slavery, so he got some pushback for using the word slavery, but we can talk about how difficult or how, how, how much force was used in the Mozambican context. That harshness, of course, was embedded in this deep prejudice towards local residents, particularly prejudice, prejudice against their ability to farm. So as Mozinho de Albuquerque said in 1902, one of the most difficult problems is, without doubt, that which results from the necessity of using indigenous labor and the difficulties that their habits of indolence, common to all wild things, present. Or as Robert E. Lynn, the second director of agriculture and a British citizen said, the African is what he is and what nature has made him. In 1914, another director for the Department of Agriculture Ernesto Jardim de Vilena argued that there is proof that for natives in their primitive state, a regime of compulsion is needed to teach them the habits of work. If we could get them to labor on these large um, uh, uh, settle on these large production areas, Vilena insisted, this would guarantee, quote, a brilliant future of intensive agriculture and industrial exploitation for the colony. In 1944, the very famous agronomist Montero de Grillo, who held many positions from the 1920s to the 1950s, including director of agriculture, described, quote unquote, native agriculture this way. He said, one cannot say that there is any real agricultural professionalism among the local residents. 
which is evidenced by their little farm with a small amount of land, without garden or orchard, almost always without cattle, just a forlorn chicken coop, practically without tools, in the hands solely of the women, and with a desolate air of an individual who prepares to move and abandon the land. I could go on and on, and you don't want me to, but the, the official sentiment, the sentiment towards local laborers, local residents, was that they were not farmers and that they needed to be put to work um, under the Europeans. Increasingly, as I sort of hinted at before, from the 1930s on, there's more and more of an argument that local laborers can work, can farm on their own in indigenous reserves and be incorporated into the commercial economy by providing uh, basically contract agriculture um, as a tithe. So the Colonial Act provides for what's referred to as the checkerboard um, uh, organization of agricultural land. And really the biggest proponent of this is Carlos de Meloviera, who served as director of agriculture in the 1930s. So contract farming or smallholder farming comes to be interwoven with larger scale commercial enterprises. The crop most identified with these local farmers was manioc. And despite having themselves introduced manioc into the country, the Portuguese held the simple tuber in great disdain. Manioc propagates vegetatively and grows well in wet or dry conditions. It requires relatively little work, can be left in the ground for up to three months after reaching maturity, and grows below the ground, um, so has natural protection from many pests, including monkeys and representatives of the state. Even in poor land, one Portuguese scholar wrote in 1960, it's enough to stick the stalks in the ground at convenient intervals to get a reasonable harvest. In the 1960s and 1970s, as Portuguese rule was coming to an end in Mozambique, manioc was the single most important foodstuff for local residents. The Portuguese and other observers argued that indigenous people are were relying on manioc naturally because their propensity to laziness, that's in quotes, <coughs> and lack of knowledge about more sophisticated farming and crops meant that they relied on manioc. As one agronomist wrote, um, expansion is primarily due to the easy method of production and good productivity in varied climactic conditions. Manioc was widely considered to be suitable for people who had no concept, they argued, of fixed property rights, who migrated from one plot to another and harvested the plant opportunistically when it was time to move on. An examination of the archives, however, suggests that manioc was not always the dominant crop in local diets. It used to be just one of many crops in diversified gardens. Early accounts of the region from European travelers in the 17 and 1800s describe seemingly bountiful indigenous gardens filled with sorghum, millet, groundnuts, and squashes. Mom's account that you can see here, published in 1906, provides one such example. He identifies gardens in local villages with a wide variety of cereals, nuts, fruits, legumes, and vegetables. In contrast to popular belief at the time, Manioc production did not expand because its agronomic characteristics mirrored the natural desires of the indigenous population. Rather, manioc production grew because it was the food colonial rulers used to prop up the local labor force. Manioc was the crop chosen by government officials, plantation owners, police officers, and military commanders to feed those under their control. On cotton plantations that Alan Isaacman describes as the mother of poverty, manioc became an important stable, staple for uh, peasant laborers. Miguel de Jesus Valadas Pais, who penned this practical guide to agriculture that became one of the most widely read guides uh, in the early 1900s, said in the last chapter of manioc that fellow colonists should plant this tuber because it, quote, provides an assured source of food for your indigenous personnel. In case of necessity, you will have something to eat yourself instead of bread, because manioc roasted or boiled is actually very edible. In addition, he noted, you can also feed it to your pigs. 
land area in Manioc on non-native farms um, tripled between 1941 and 1951 from 1,178 hectares to 3,614, an increase that mirrors the increase in cotton production over the same period. And really, the census information on manioc production is um, very poor. They could really only reliably look at manioc production that was happening on European farms, not um, local production. By the 1960s, planting manioc and cotton together was the official recommendation. Despite or because of the importance as a local food crop, the importance of manioc as a local food crop, very little scientific research went into the crop. In 1962, the official handbook on farming in Mozambique reported that, quote, the study of varieties existing in Mozambique still has not been done, although we are already working on introducing varieties from other countries. As a result, the technical recommendations for production were very simplistic, basically dig a hole. So then I'm going to fast forward from this landscape of manioc production and a certain kind of naturalization as manioc being the chosen food for local laborers because of its natural characteristics, fast forward to the time when research does start up in manioc, which is the 1990s, when a series of droughts in sub-Saharan Africa threatens um, uh, famines, but also is accompanied by cassava brown stripe disease and uh, an international effort to try to focus on research uh, into manioc. Under these circumstances, there were new large-scale multinational breeding programs that were focused on developing or breeding new disease-resistant varieties. There was some discussion about combating low manioc yields and um, insufficient harvests by focusing not on breeding but on land management. So providing or selecting clean material in situ with farmers, getting rid of the infected material and replanting the clean stalks. But the official argument was that targeting land management instead of breeding would be fruitless because, quote, success for such clean seed programs usually depends on having a well-defined commercial seed sector operating in an institutionally developed economic environment. This is a little bit of a surprising statement given that the dissemination of both new varieties and clean versions of existing varieties would depend on a functioning seed sector for distribution. But developing new varieties was the more customary, I would argue, an easier path than focusing on land management. The new varieties were being bred um, and very slowly disseminated to local farmers when I was in Mozambique between 2014 and 2017. With the development of these new varieties and this research focus on manioc, this initiative emerged to build a market for manioc beer. The beer was called Impala, after the small African antelope, and distilled by the Cervejas de Mozambique, a subsidiary of the largest beer conglomerate in the world, Anheuser-Busch. A Dutch company called the Dutch Agricultural Development and Trading Company, or DADCO for its acronym, developed a mobile processing unit, an MPU, that could be located near project smallholders and moved regularly. The third partner in this project to promote manioc production for beer um, was the International Fertilizer Development Corporation, the IFDC, which distributed new varieties as it could, as possible, as it got them, um, and trained farmers in what were mandatory new techniques that covered everything from, if you wanted to be part of the project, creating a nursery, selecting good stocks, to planting, timing, spacing, and harvesting. IFDC and DADCO selected project participants. This is just the mobile processing unit that you can see here. Deliveries of manioc and categorization or um, accounting of the manioc that you bring. IFDC and DADCO selected project participants and facilitators carefully 
and many farmers joined enthusiastically, although to do so, they were required to really change the way that they planted and harvested. They attended workshops to learn how to plant in lines with exact spacing and specific days on which to deliver their harvest. The emphasis on timing is critical as manioc begins to ferment roughly 24 hours after the roots are pulled from the ground. So it can stay in the ground for a long time, um, but once it's harvested, once it's pulled out, it has 24 hours before it begins the fermentation process after which the uh, beer company cannot use it for the starch. So DADCO implemented a ticket system um, handing out these dated tickets to every farmer and providing them with a three-day window in which to deliver their manioc to the MPU. Once the starch is processed into blocks, which you saw earlier, then those blocks can sit around um, for quite a while, for months. So the crucial time period is really that first 24 hours after the harvest. In other words, the farmers were required to adapt their labor to the spatial and temporal logics of the market. The new techniques weren't necessarily very difficult, although there was some discussion about the planting in lines um, being more difficult, but they weren't necessarily more difficult, they were just different than the way that they had been planted. They required more labor for planting than subsistence production, though, and this meant that while manioc production was typically women's work, they didn't have the time to engage necessarily, and so farmers who had more land, um, or who were better connected, or had leadership positions, or who became familiar with IFDC or DADCO early on, they were able to hire in labor in order to clean their land, to plant, to weed, and harvest. Perhaps more importantly, the relationship between the farmers and IFDC DADCO started as very promising. But by the second year, the market price for manioc had dropped by half, by the manioc deliveries. DADCO established a floor price, but 2.5 mechikais per kilo, which is, uh, was roughly four cents a day. I didn't do the math for this. Um, so that's roughly four cents per kilo minus the transportation costs from the field to the MPU, if you've required that. That was considered too low to warrant production and also a violation of the agreement that farmers had had with DADCO going into the project that they would receive this higher price. DADCO insisted that they could only pay farmers better if farmers could guarantee sufficient supply on set days. Otherwise, the beer company couldn't rely on them, they couldn't increase their production, this couldn't then provide more of a stable market for the farmers, and there were few other opportunities um, for the manioc, particularly because the IFDC was promoting the bitter varieties of manioc, which are, um, re requires more work to uh, boil and then eat them because of the cyanide. The farmers I spoke with complained about not getting what they considered to be a fair price, but they were also upset with DADCO for not providing what they saw as appropriate social assistance. So here's one example where they were seeking remediation for environmental damage that they argued was directly due to the mobile processing unit. DADCO representatives shook their head in some, uh, you know, concern. They, they threw their hands up at this request for help, arguing that people were trained to ask for things instead of working. But asking for assistance is part of the history, is part of the way that people do business, and particularly with the farmers' associations. The president of the association said, the company asks me for everything, and they don't do anything for us. We just think they should help us. We think that they should provide some support for the production. When he heard this, a DADCO representative said angrily that they just want things for the association. It's not the company's responsibility to do something about social goods. I would argue that that sentiment illustrated the problem with one of the problems with this new initiative for manioc production. Manioc was the crop the colonial government and landowners had used to maintain a labor force for their plantations. As such, manioc was the glue that allowed communities to survive harsh labor conditions. Under this new system, however, manioc was stripped of its social meanings and recast as a new kind of commodity crop for which the farmers were to provide their labor. 
Not to mention the fact that none of the farmers I talked to had actually ever tasted Impala beer because it was too expensive. Although well-intentioned, this project, it eventually faltered because local farmers were once again expected to serve the market, adapting their labor in service of the spatial and temporal logics. Accessing this new technology required changing one naturalization for another. So changing the naturalization of the former colonial period, sorry, um, of the former colonial period into this new naturalization as the economic subject. So I know this was a, a long talk with a lot of arguments in it, so I just want to summarize and say that my main argument is that from the Portuguese to pro-Savannah, Mozambique has been dominated by a plantation ideal. The ideal has shaped agricultural science and research. It has shaped government policies for economic progress and rural development, and also the nature and capacity of local labor. And it explains why pro-Savannah, the project that I started with, made sense. Mozambican officials offered up the country's land and labor as they had done for over 100 years. Rural peasant groups, led by UNACI, the Farmers Union, and Justicia Ambiental, uh, Environmental Justice, objected fiercely to Pro Savannah almost from the beginning. They created the No to Pro Savannah campaign that received wide international support. Luis Mushunga, who was the former president of UNACI, said of Pro Savannah, quote, this was one more document from outside, designed by foreigners who have finance capital and will come here for investments, and so this is why we say no, end quote. Representatives from farmer organizations visited the Brazilian Sahambu, so representatives from Justiça Ambiental and from um, UNACI and ORAM, with the self-help organization of Mozambique, they visited the Brazilian Sahadu and they came away really disturbed by this sort of endless expanse, endless fields. They didn't understand how that model could be adapted to or imposed on Mozambique. And I would argue that this orientation towards large-scale investments, this plantation ideal, is likely only going to get worse in coming years with the revision of the land policy in 2022, which is more market-driven um, and creates a land market that will help to facilitate um, natural resource commodification. The emphasis, too, on things like carbon markets, new markets, and also traditional ones like minerals and natural gas. So what, what is to be done? Um, the conclusion to my book is co-written by a brilliant scholar, Natasha Bruna. She worked for years with, um, on, on agrarian issues, particularly related to extractivism, and she worked with the Rural Observatory of Mo, um, Mozambique, or OMR, the Rural Observatory. So together, Natasha and I asked academics and activists from across the country and then internationally what they thought the right path forward was for Mozambique today. These are individuals who've been pushing for alternatives to the plantation for many years, although not necessarily in a way that is coordinated or visible to policymakers. So the main argument that these activists and others make is that local communities should be the means and the end of development efforts, not just a means to an end. Laura German has this great book on the global land grab and how um, the multilateral aid agencies develop this uh, policy towards large-scale land acquisitions. And she quotes a farmer in it who says, it's not that we don't want investment. We want people to invest. We just don't want them to invest in our land. We want them to invest in us. So I'm just going to give you uh, the overview from a few of these colleagues who we talked to. Um, Jan de Moor, who's an engineer who's researched water and agricultural politics in Zambezia for many years, he argues that an authoritarian plantation culture still affects social consciousness in that region, and what is needed is security regarding the use of land and sale of agricultural goods. So, so guaranteed markets, I think, are significant given the number of times that Mozambican farmers have been convinced to plant products only to then find that the market has, the floor has fallen out of that market. Um, so uh, 
community land use plans and financial resources for farmers to increase production. These are needed if they are supported and driven by the farmers themselves. Uh, Wasitisa Mendamule from the Rural Observatory argues that public policies and discourses all lean towards large-scale investments and a key need is for greater participation in the formulation of public policies. Teresa Cunha from the University of Coimbra emphasizes the need for environmental regulations in particular and a tax on profits from large-scale enterprises. Bernhard Weimer, professor at the University of Eduardo Mondlane, argues that large-scale investments are not options, should not be options. Instead, Mozambique needs innovative, environmentally and socially conscious approaches rooted in the family sector and focused on women as the linchpins for both production and social reproduction. Annabella Lemos, the director of Justicia Ambiental, which I mentioned before, a key piece of the No to Pro Savannah campaign, she argues that Mozambique needs to rescue ancestral practices. So her focus is really on traditional agriculture and agroecology, the use of native seeds and crops. She advocates for small scale processing facilities that provide a price floor and guarantee of purchase. Bernardo Manzano Fernandes, who's a Brazilian geographer at the State University of Sao Paulo, he draws on his experience with the landless movement in Brazil to argue for food sovereignty. So this idea that the local farmers need to have more independence and autonomy in deciding their own agricultural fate. And he particularly draws on the Brazilian program, the PAA, or the provision or purchase of agricultural goods from smallholders for government purposes or for public purposes. This has been hugely successful in Brazil, buying up agricultural goods from land reform settlements for local schools and hospitals. Mariam Abbas, who researches food security and climate change at the Royal Observatory, argues that we should prioritize traditional production systems and internal markets. So none of these um, uh, solutions is the wrong word. None of these ideas are rocket science. Um, none of them are very complicated, but they all share a focus on development that starts with local people and sees them as the purpose and future of the country rather than as an input into the plantation economy. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks Wendy. I'm very conscious that I'm standing in between you and asking Wendy questions and eight o'clock. So I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to try to be uh, brief as, um, yes, I'm going to try to be brief. So the book is eagerly anticipated um, as a new contribution from Wendy Wolfort, whose name really is synonymous with critical agrarian studies and analysis of the global land grab. So Wendy's work, as you all know to date, is mostly associated with the Latin American context and especially Brazil. So this book is a departure in that she makes her foray into Africa, into Mozambique. So the book, I, actually I didn't read the book, I read a precy. So my comments are organized around this proposal or precy that I read. And what I understand from the proposal is that it's a kind of journey over the history of agricultural development in Mozambique, inserting this into the global history of plantation, plantation agriculture and the idea of the plantation itself, as the title of the talk suggests. The focus, as Wendy has described um, amply, on this Pro Savannah project in Mozambique that sort of died before it actually ever got started, but was this massively ambitious 14 million hectare project um, that was a to bring development to northern uh, Mozambique. So I would like to say, uh, before I say anything else, that I basically agree with with everything Wendy said. <laughs> I agree with, I endorse the main thrust of the book and um, I, I endorse the, the descriptive material and the analysis and I also support the main 
um, sort of objective, if you want, of the study, which is to call for a different kind of agriculture for Mozambique, one that works for local people. Um, I agree that the plantation model is extractive, and I agree that it's been seen, Wendy says a quick fix, I would say a kind of big bang, maybe a different kind of metaphor for development in colonies and ex-colonies and internal colonies um, across much of the world. So um, I agree with that. E even so, I would like to delve into what I understand as the argument in a few respects and raise some questions about the framing as I interpret it from the Precy. And I think um, questions that are not just, you know, for the record or to, for kind of an empirical debate, but also are relevant for activism and for reform. So, so my comments will push off of the main framing of the project. So in setting up the matter of pro-Savannah, Wendy asks, as she summarized here too, not who is responsible for the failure of Pro Savannah, but rather why anyone thought this was a good idea in the first place. Why did anyone even try to undertake this massive project and a project of this sort? So as she says, why promote large scale mechanized agriculture for export in Mozambique when the majority of the population are hungry, farming on small plots of land using hand tools? So why? So it's a seemingly simple question, and I would break it down into multiple questions that are sort of embedded in the way that it's framed. And so why export agriculture when people are hungry? Why large scale when this is not the predominant mode of production in Mozambique if most farmers are small scale, even though small scale farming apparently is demonstrably not up to the task of sustaining livelihoods because people are still hungry? And why mechanized? when people are using um, hand tools. There's some other unasked questions here. Why foreign actors? Why foreign capital? Why this lineup of foreign actors? And why extraction? Um, and then why not some other form of extraction if we're going to do extraction? So the rhetorical strategy that Wendy adopts in setting up the book is why, the, why is this plantation ideal so resilient in Mozambique? So the plantation ideal. Why this imaginary or this way of thinking about development? So the critical move in the, in the framing, as I understand it, is to focus on the problem of the plantation imaginary, um, how people th do this kind of knowledge and reasoning around the plantation, and why so many actors of the colonial state, the, post -colonial, the private companies, the post-colonial leaders, progressive as they claim to be, um, why so many actors rally around this single suspect model of the, of the plantation? Why, why do they all buy into this? And she argues also, sort of going forward off of this idea of the plantation, that this idea of the plantation and plantations themselves are the root cause of undevelopment, underdevelopment in Mozambique. So the root cause of Mozambique's poverty is this kind of plantation agriculture. And I, I think the purpose of this framing, if I, can, if I can put it that way, is partially pedagogical in that the book tries to get us to think against the plantation model. Like what are the alternatives? Could it be any different? If people thought of this of agricultural development in this particular way, what other way are, uh, what other ways are there? And she ends up in the proposal on this conservation agriculture more more or less or included in the lines of the final comments in her presentation. So what I would like to do very briefly um, is just uh, to push back against this idea of the plantation imaginary and say that, I mean, this could be a, a reason in some way that we see this kind of development pursued in Mozambique, but that actually there are other reasons. And focusing on the imaginary sort of hides or d pushes attention away from the other reasons that are more material and political. And I also think that focusing on the imaginary per se is a kind of self-limiting strategy in terms of politics because it doesn't identify the other actors and the other politics that must be grappled with really to, to implement or move toward reform 
um, and an alternative. So that's, that's what I would like to do briefly. So um, to get there by asking a couple different why questions. And these come from somebody, be, come from my, my scholarly focus on African political economy, political economy of African countries. So these other questions have to do with plantation versus non-plantation agriculture. And from there, a question about what determines what form of extraction prevails. And then use these questions to circle back to the question about the, the cure or the strategy of reform. So on the first point, plantation versus non-plantation agriculture. Um, so coming from the broader study of agricultural development in the 20th and 21st century in other African countries, what's really striking to me is that everything that Wendy attributes to the plantation model here also applies to non-plantation export agriculture in sub-Saharan African countries. So most African countries do not center their agricultural development strategies or their export strategies around plantation agriculture. So most African countries, especially in West and, part, and parts of East Africa, have developed export agriculture on the basis of, of smallholder agriculture, what we used to call peasant agriculture, smallholder. So it's not the, the plantation model. It's not large scale. It's not foreign ownership. It's not monocropping. It's not plantation. It's smallholder. But the smallholder model has a lot of the shared attributes. It's extractive. It um, comes from the same kind of colonial science around solving the labor problem, neglecting food crops, um, research and dis into the discipline of how to discipline smallholder farmers, focus on progressives. A lot of the ale, the this sort of uh, pathological features of plantation agriculture also apply to this smallholder development. So if smallholder agriculture is similar to plantation in these ways, we can't say that then plantation is the cause of the problem. And smallholder agriculture also is associated with many of the same kinds of, of or generically associated with underdevelopment in that it's, it's chronically extractive and sort of characterized by a form of involution that doesn't really spur more diversified or larger larger forms of development. So if we get the same, if we get the same outcomes from non-plantation agriculture, then we can ask again, what is the goal or driver of, of these, form, this, these different forms of agriculture that are extractive? And I would say, you know, and I don't think Wendy would disagree with this at all. I'm sure she doesn't. This question may be a framing. But the answer is, is that, you know, the source of this kind of agriculture isn't the, the plantation imaginary. It's the interests that are interested in extraction. So the powerful actors want to extract. That's why they, they look for different forms of extractive agriculture. And then these different actors, the colonial, post-colonial authorities, the, the scientists, the agronomists, et cetera, you know, they get wrapped up into these kinds of extractive projects that are largely defined by the powerful actors that are present. And what do the powerful actors want? They want profits, they want foreign exchange for the state, tax revenue for the state, and all of these things that, you know, are really the drivers behind the, the extraction. So I, I make these points to broaden this idea of the imaginary being the source of the problem. So second point, why plantations are some places and not other places? And here, too, what I'm going to say is something that doesn't, you know, Wendy could say this herself. So I'm just bringing it up for the purposes of discussion. Um, so the question is, why do we have plantations in some places, in, let's just stick to sub-Saharan Africa, in some places, and smallholder agriculture in other places? Um, so I would say this, just schematically speaking, has to do with kind of the, or yes, the, the division of the, of the rents, or the division of the benefits to be had. So where we get smallholder agriculture that is extractive and export oriented, there is indeed where it's sustainable a different division of the benefits. So in the kind of extractive agriculture at the extreme, the plantation model that Wendy was focusing on, maybe the you know, local residents get zero and the state gets 50 and the foreign interests and the financiers get 
50, or maybe even the local producers are driven into, they, get, they become worse off, and I would agree with that description, that they're worse off, so they're minus, minus 10. And, but in this, the more um, sustainable smallholder export economies and the ones that persisted after the end of colonial rule in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a different division of the benefits. So the smallholders are actually out of, let's say, if we can imagine 100 uh, on a, a metric like this, the smallholders are getting maybe 20, 25, or 30 percent of the benefits. So part of the reason the, this kind of extractive agriculture is sustained is because it is, let's say, less extractive or less predatory, or there's a wider circle of beneficiaries. And indeed, you know, some African countries are some of the world's largest exporters of tropical commodities like cocoa, and it has generated a kind of pr prosperous smallholder agriculture in, in, in many countries of West Africa. So why do we get plantation agriculture in some places and smallholder in others? It's really the plantation is kind of a last resort. or That's the way we would generally understand it. These are places where, if we focus on the colonial period, the colonial authorities really were not able to, to um, harness land and labor to export crop production through market incentives, either very low population densities far away from markets or existing settlement patterns or modes of production in agriculture really did not lend themselves to export agriculture. So the plantation comes in as the most coercive kind of model. So expropriation of land and moving labor coercively to work on the plantation. So the plantation is sort of the poster child for the most coercive, coercive most difficult to sustain and in most African colonies, once they become once independent, plantation agriculture is not sustained precisely because it is so coercive. And so we kind of see some of that in Mozambique in the, the sort of failure of or frustrations with the, the plantation uh, model. So that is to say, um, briefly, maybe two main points then to wind up. Um, so extraction is really the overriding motive. It, Extraction is the mechanism that attracts foreign capital, that builds capacity to earn foreign exchange, that earns government tax revenues. And these are the interests of the powerful actors. So to get to conservation agriculture or similar alternative models, we need to get around the powerful actors also. It's a radical transformation of you know, the distribution of power um, in place. And that is a... I agree that imaginary is important, but this is a kind of different, a different, different talk, a, a larger or more different kind of political project. Secondly, and this is this is difficult too. What about the kind of extraction that is less exploitative, but also still has some of the same problems? It's it's perhaps probably not sustainable in the in the long run. It can be environmentally damaging, and it somehow does perpetuate or lock in place a kind of process of underdevelopment that, that blocks alternatives. But the fact of the matter here is when we talk about interests, it's not just you know, the exploitative foreigners and the self-interested governments, but it's ordinary people, ordinary farmers who are deeply invested in this kind of extractive, maybe extractive with a small e, extractive agriculture, but that you know, is really sustaining Livelihoods, they say in Cote d'Ivoire, it's 30% of the population lives off of cocoa production, an entire national political economy founded on that. So what do we do about this kind of extraction? That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, you know, I'd love to hear people's questions and comments, but maybe I'll just briefly uh, touch on imaginary and the maybe there's a um, uh, difference in the way that I'm thinking of imaginary and not being clear enough about what an imaginary is because an imaginary to me isn't something that's just in the imagination. It is very much something that is grounded and empirically um, physically relevant in places. People talk about plantations and their specific emplacement and the people who work in them, the economies, like you said, that they generate the sort of political interests. 
So all of that is present, I would argue, with plantations in Mozambique. But I wanted to do an additional sort of understanding of the plantation, not just as those specific spaces and that specific economy tied to it, but also as this ideal and as this way of seeing landscapes in a particular kind of orderly and extractive way. So the imaginary is really intended to be a political economy of agricultural production. Um, with an understanding of who profits from that, who, who is involved in production, um, but sort of enabling me not to only think about plantations as those specific forms of production, but also as shaping an entire infrastructure around them that then um, incorporate people in ways where you might look at the smallholders who are producing manioc today for the beer company or for otherwise, and you would say, well, manioc production, even in this new IFDC DADCO format, is not a plantation, right? And of course it's not. So the argument isn't that they are necessarily incorporated into a plantation economy per se with manioc production, but that the limits of what is possible and the conditions under which they're operating have been shaped by this long-term desire and economy of plantations in Mozambique. So it's just, uh, so imaginary, maybe I didn't mean quite so much in the imagination, but something that has real um, uh, material and cultural, social, political uh, grounding or implications. But I'll leave it at that. And um, thank you so much. I'm just over here frantically taking notes on this um, incredible presentation and discussion. Thank you both. Um, we will open the floor to um, discussions, for questions from the audience and also online. Um, if you're here, please raise your hand. I'll select questions and rounds. Um, and if you raise your hand, then someone will bring you a microphone. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and if you're online, please type short questions into the Q&A box at the top left of your screen and we will try to get to as many as possible. Um, and please um, announce your name and affiliation when you ask questions or write them. Yes, right here. Thanks. Um, my name is Margo. I'm a master's student here at LSE as well in the Department of International Development. Um, and I just wanted to hear your take on, this might be controversial, but I would like to hear your take on the role of industrialization in Africa. What is the place, is, industri is industrialization perhaps a solution um, as in industrialization, like the altering the sectoral composition of an economy, would that be a solution um, to these kinds of problems? Um, does democracy have a place in uh, being a solution for this? Um, and yeah, overall, what is your take on these big words? All right, we'll take a couple questions, and then um, if, you, if you wanna just hand it to the person next to you, and then up here. Um, my name's uh, Mark Norris. I actually did my undergraduate degree here and postgraduate degrees here, and I'm actually a lawyer in private practice, did a lot of work across Africa. One of the things I uh, picked up in one of the comments about moving from plantation agriculture was um, small-scale food processing, and certainly my experience across Africa is what's missing is post-harvest infrastructure. That's, that's a big gap. And if there is a gap, how do we fund that post-harvest infrastructure to make sure the warehousing, the processing is there? Because the level of waste is phenomenal when, when you look at uh, agriculture in Africa and is the way to move forward actually to focus on, as one of the observers pointed mm -hmm. out, that, that small scale processing and then from that, good will follow. Thank you. Question right up here, and then back here, and then we'll give Wendy and a chance. A question. Okay, my name is Augustine, and I've been studying economics, uh, I think, years ago in university. So uh, what we actually looked into back then was uh, the differentiation between settlement and extractive colonies. Brazil is very different from Mozambique. I mean, we see that people are trying to actually bring the success of Brazil uh, to Mozambique. 
But that's a fundamental difference in the sense that Brazil was indeed a settlement column, but Mozambique was more of an extract. I mean, Brazil had the extractive uh, element, but Brazil had a temperate climate zone, right, where many Europeans settled. And another second component is the, Brazil, uh, the project Brazil had Japanese participation. And Brazil has a very sizable Japanese, ethnic Japanese population. And the Japanese were brought into Brazil to work in plantations historically in the 30s. And this contributed perhaps, you know, to perhaps, you know, more skill and perhaps, you know, more so-called, you know, uh, because the, the Japanese in Brazil are also the ethnic Japanese are the merchant class. They managed to move out the ranks. So you do have, you know, this sort of ethnic diversity in Brazil. Whereas in Mozambique, it seems to me, Mozambique, when I was there about uh, six years ago, uh, either you had the local indigenous population or very small elite uh, mestizo population. So I was just wondering whether endowment effect and also the differentiation is there between settlement colony and extractive colony legacy issues will have a much larger impact instead of all these so-called you know, institutions or whatever, you know, policies or whatever. Thank you. Um, there one question back here. Hi there. Um, my name is Luther Hinger. Great presentation. Um, very informative. Um, my question is, um, the massive takeaway that I got from this, in fact, was um, for countries like Mozambique, and uh, their prosperity is important to actually invest in their people rather than, of course, the land. So according to your experience, quite interested to hear your insight on what would you do for the people of Mozambique for their prosperity in terms of investment and programs um, to improve the country's future? Okay, I'm gonna let Wendy respond to some of these questions and then come to Claire after. Also, I have no idea how to take questions from online. If while well, she's doing that, somebody wants to people are show how to do that. obediently typing them into the. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you for um, thank you for the questions. Um, another thought that I had in responding uh, to you had so many good points. I think, um, Catherine just briefly to talk about uh, the sort of new pro savanna which started in 2017 which is called sustenta in mozambique um, this was intended to sort of correct some of the aspects of pro savanna by focusing more on smallholder farmers it was going to be 20,000 or so small farmers who were integrated then with commercial farmers um, and given a kind of kit of uh, production inputs, you know, so technology, seeds, credit, they were going to then be concentrated in particular areas. Um, uh, blocks or centers have a way to uh, bring their produce and um, uh, um, ensure that they had access to technical expertise, but also to the market. So that was started roughly when Pro Savannah, Pro Savannah didn't end with any kind of necessary sort of like, um, you know, final ceremony. Uh, it, the Brazilians would argue it ended when it was supposed to, it ended when the contract ended. Um, there was uh, some sort of disagreement about who shut the project down or how it ended. But Sacenta started roughly when Pro Savannah came to an end, and the a rural observatory did an analysis of Sustenta with their pilot projects between 2017 and 2019. Natasha's maybe on the line, and she could speak to this better than I can, but their reports of the sort of new Pro Savannah are pretty damning, and they're kind of along the lines of what you're talking about. This was not a plantation project per se, but the analysis that they did suggested that the inputs that were provided were largely focused on um, highly mechanized and industrial types of agriculture, so access to tractors um, and to other excessive fertilizer, things that were um, not appropriate to the local conditions or ecologies. These kits were handed out pretty um, uh, widely without consideration of the local ecology and the farmers who were favored were farmers who already had access to um, for Limo or to the, the one-party state. 
um, in the end, the program focused predominantly on the larger farmers, so the small handful of commercial farmers who were supposed to then act as that pole of development and pull everybody else up, but who in fact were the ones who were able to take advantage of the technological kit. Um, so that's just to say that even when you have projects that are articulated quite against the plantation, meant to be something that focuses on smallholders, many of the same dynamics um, do still apply. Many of the same um, extractive sort of tendencies, I think. Whether you can argue that that's because it's building on a long history of plantation economics or because there are ways in which the um, uh, rollout by the state was particularly uh, partial and also um, uh, um, oriented, you know, towards the, the state um, uh, politics or, or towards um, those who were able to access uh, favors or um, other um, benefits from the state. So, yeah, Some, I'll think about this idea of what does it mean if you can say that smallholder agriculture in other countries provides the exact same um, mechanisms or aspects of, of um, extraction or exploitation. Um, that, that's not an answer exactly. <laughs> so the question um, is industrialization a solution and does democracy have a place? I mean, I certainly hope that democracy has a potential or a place. I think that's exactly what the people who I described and what the conversation about alternatives really focuses on. It's really about asking for a democratic, if not decentralization, democratic participation in the solutions for, for Mozambique's future so that the um, credit, the foreign investment that comes in, that this could be um, led by the people in the country, led by people who are living in the rural areas as opposed to imposed on them. So democracy, of course, I think is important. I think industrialization, um, you know, I would put it in the same category as thinking about um, regional or small scale processing units, right? Huge um, waste, one third of the harvests are wasted um, or spoiled before they're uh, able to be um, used. I think that the kind of post harvesting uh, process would, th it's already something that is very much on people's minds, so creating spaces where you can aggregate um, product and then uh, be able to access the seller more directly are already very significant. They're just not sufficient for the produce that's out there. So I do think that aggregating in, you see this, you know, I think in the Brazilian context, which I'm um, more familiar with it with the MST in terms of those kind of small scale processing units. You have local um, products like uh, bananas that would spoil quickly, but with local processing, you can turn them into candies or other, you know, more industrialized um, products that will last longer. So I think that kind of aggregation and um, processing is really key to making local economies and local markets. Um, so having more of an internal market than an orientation towards export is, is really key. Um, Brazil and Mozambique, yeah, are really different. Um, and that was one of the things that was interesting in sort of the push to say that Africa would be the next frontier for Brazilian farmers, you know. Um, Lula made a lot of comments about his African brothers and the blood they shared and the debt they owed and the sort of move to Africa under Lula was about finding some kind of connection um, or tie, particularly in Angola and Mozambique, although he really focused his efforts more broadly in Africa as part of his push to have Brazil be a, a world leader. Um, I think the, the, the differences um, between Brazil and Mozambique are pretty significant, and those differences, like I said in the talk, become the subject of some, um, you know, discrimination even by the Brazilians who say, look, we have all of these great, you know, that same um, 
Brazilian scientist who I quoted, he goes on to say, we have all of these great farmers in our country, from the Germans who know how to fix everything and the Japanese who know how to grow everything. And here you don't have that, right? And so it was a dramatic sort of, um, you know, racialization of hierarchy that um, was intended to sort of say, here you don't have this kind of expertise and, and that's why you can't take up this, this um, productive agriculture in these ways. So I think, um, you know, deeply problematic. Um, but there's no question that the, the colonial rule in Mozambique was not able to establish large-scale settlement um, in the way that you had in southern Brazil. Northern, northeastern Brazil is much more of a, an extractive sugarcane economy from the beginning. Um, somebody asked what, I, I wrote down multi-dimensional poverty. Oh, somebody asked what I would say. Um, and I think I would say, well, I would echo what other people put forward in their um, responses to the question, you know, what would you say about Mozambique's future? Um, I do think just from a lot of our conversations with smallholders, particularly in the north, um, it's difficult for them to engage in projects in part because this notion of multidimensional poverty that I mentioned, a lack of access to everything from healthcare to schools to roads to um, you know, markets for agricultural production, but it meant that many of them couldn't participate even in small-scale projects that were geared towards them because they were sick or they couldn't get that far or they didn't have um, care for the children or the children were sick. So there's just this um, lack of public service or infrastructure that I think would go a long way towards enabling that kind of um, internal sovereignty or that internal autonomy that people talk about is necessary for participation in the debate. All right. Um, thank you for those answers to those questions. I'm afraid that we are out of time. So, um, uh, Claire, please ask your question later. And Emily, if you could just aggregate the questions and we can make sure that they get to Wendy afterwards. Um, thank you all so much for being here and to Wendy and Catherine um, for this discussion. Um, I've so enjoyed it. Thank you.